This is December 4th, 2001. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is John Coates. Today we have with us Galliano Melchiori. Did I say that correctly? You said it correct. Good. Yeah. Now I understand that folks call you Gal. Yeah. Okay, yeah, then yeah. we'll do that today. That's right, yeah. If that's okay. Um, Gal, uh, when were you born? Uh, 1916, September 24th. And where were you born? Yeah, Copper Cliff, Ontario. Really? Yeah. yeah. Copper Cliff, that's got a, a nice name to it. Yeah. And what is your current address? What that? Where do you live now? I live in South Natick on Pleasant Street. Oh, down by the waterfall, down in that area? Yeah, right, yeah by the falls. Very yeah. nice part of the town. Yeah. And your marital uh, status, are you married? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have children? I have six children. And when and where did you enter the military? Yeah, I think it was either October or November of 42, 1942. I'm not going to do the math. How old were you then? How old was I then? Let's see. Uh, probably in 28, maybe 28, was it going to be 28 years old? Oh, it's, it's not that important. That's, I'll do the math later. Okay. Uh, and where did you enter the military? At uh, Camp Devons. We went to Boston and then we went, took our test in Boston, and we went to Camp Devons. Did you sign up, or, or uh, did you go to some recruiting office somewhere in Boston or somewhere? Yeah, we, we had uh, tested, you know, look uh, how physically fit and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And why did you pick the United States Army? Uh, I lived, I was brought here, I graduated from the Navy High School, and I grew up here in the Navy Yard, what they call the Navy Yard. To, yeah, and uh, I had no other choice. I didn't want to go back to Canada. I didn't know Canada. And I just stayed here and I entered. I was drafted, really. Oh, okay. I had my choice to come here or here or Canada. Where I graduated here and grew up here, all my friends were here, my family. So that's. So you, you picked the United States yeah, Army? Right, yeah, yeah. Did friends or uh, any of your buddies? join the army at the same time? Oh yeah, there was about, uh, I think there was about 152 from Natick that were drafted that same day. We took the train right here in Natick and went into Boston and then into Camp Devons. Tell us about Camp Devons. What was that like? Well, there was a, I guess that was a recruiting station where they ask you what uh, you're supposed to do and where you're going. Of course, they gave you secret papers and you open them wherever you're, you're supposed to be going to. So they just processed you and the other guys to figure out where they were going That's to send right, you? That's right, yeah. Did they ask you at all at Fort Deffens what you would like to do in the Army, or did they give you any kind of tests? Well, they asked you what you did in civilian life, mostly. Okay. I was a musician, and they put me in the band at the beginning of the war. I, I, I went to... Um, from here, I went all alone to Carlsbad, New Mexico. What in the world did they send you there for? Well, they were forming some kind of a band in the Air Force. And that's my first, that was my first experience in Carlsbad, New Mexico. Tell us what instruments you played. I played, uh, when I was in the band, I played the bass drum. And, but then they, um, they needed, the, the Battle of the Bulge was coming up, and they needed the GIs, and I was transferred from there to... Uh, well, that's, that's three years away, so the, you must have done something in the in the. In oh, the, in the meantime. band, we were doing for, we were playing for uh, the movie stars that were coming in, the, the base, and they were selling uh, bonds, government bonds. Well, how long were you in New Mexico? In New Mexico, I was in there uh, since uh, 44, two years, I think. I you was were in two there. years two there? Two years, yeah. Did you stay on that one base? Yeah, that one base, yeah. Yeah. And so people would come into your area sell, selling war bonds? 
the the movie stars used to come in there. Yeah. And then we'd go around the different places and play and uh, to sell war bonds. Right, yeah. How far, uh, how far did you travel uh, out of New Mexico? Where did some of the, tell us some of the places you went to. Well, we went to, um, let's see, um, I think it was the, where did Judge Roy Bean play in, in the movie there, that town? Texas, Pecos, Texas. Pecos, Texas, yeah, we played in Pecos. And uh, we played in Marathon, Texas, and we played in Alpine, Texas, the bases of Marfa, and we played in Alpine, Alpine and uh, those are the three places I can remember right now. That's about 100 miles oh, north uh, of the Mexican border. over 100 border. miles traveling, yeah. yeah. So you got to, to see a lot of the Southwest then. Yeah, yeah. Is, at any point along this way bef uh, before becoming a musician in the, in the Army, uh, did you get infantry training? From then, I went to Camp Hood, Texas. Ah, okay. And that's where I got my training. Tell us about that. Well, let's see. We used to have night maneuvers. And... Uh, then there, during the day, we'd, travel, we'd walk with, with the pack on us, with the packs, about 26 miles. Hmm. And uh, then we went on the, uh, firing, on the firing line on the field where you practice shooting your uh, different your rifles. And they had some, uh, some sort of machine guns. And I happened to be, uh, that's where I got my sharp shooting medal in Camp Hood, Texas. So So you were a good shot. Oh, I was a good shot. I was a nice <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Did everybody in the band uh, get turned into infantrymen or was it just you or or how come you became an infantryman? I was I was the only one. I don't know where the other where the other because the, the band uh, what you call it, they disbanded. Yeah. They closed the base. See? And that's they separated all, the, wherever they went, I couldn't tell you where they went, but I know where I went. I went to Camp Hood, Texas, and that's where I got my training for overseas. Yeah, yeah. Can you tell us, uh, I know it's a long time ago, but approximately the time that you were in Texas, Fort Hood? Uh, let's see, I, I don't know how long I was there, but after, we, after I got through there, I came here into Boston. No, I went to Camp Mead. I went to Camp Mead. And from there, that's where we got our, um, what they call APO, overseas something. You get your equipment, your helmets, and your, you know, all your battle uh, things that you get there. Where is Camp Mead? Maryland. Maryland. Yeah. And yeah. from there, you got ready to go overseas. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, d what outfit were you in? I was in the 10th Armored Infantry Battalion. And uh, I, from Camp Mead, we came up here to Boston. This was our... And then uh, from Boston, we went to New Jersey. I think that's where, where we got shipped out from New Jersey. Okay. Let's back up a second here. Is there a distinction... Is there a difference between infantry and armored infantry? Yeah, right. What made you an armored infantry man? What was the difference? I couldn't tell you that because I wouldn't know that. But they just put me on something that I was armored infantry. That's all I became. Did you train with tanks? Yeah, we rode on the tanks all the time. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. as an infantry man, you rode into combat on tanks. That's right. We, was it your job to defend the tank? Our job was to, we were spearhead. That was our mission, to spearhead. We go into a city and take it over and, and go around the perimeter and, and seize the town and hold on to it. And then we hoped that the foot infantry would come up and relieve us. And then we continue on to another mission. Okay, so, so let's get you overseas then. You, you think you sailed out of Newark, New Jersey. 
yeah. the port of Newark. Yeah, I think that uh, was the, Do you remember the ship you were on or how big it was? I think it was one of the, the largest ship we had in the United States. I think it was the United States. Mm -hmm. and, and every time it made a mission overseas, I, there was 15,000 of us on that ship. And it was very fast. It, it was, was fast. fast, that's yeah. right, that's right, it was fast. And I think it was the United States at that time. But then every time I made a mission, they changed the name. They made her think that there was more than one ship all the time. That's what I heard, you know. But it was a big ship, and we had 15,000 troops on it. It's inconceivable for me to think of 15,000 guys yeah. All on one ship. All on one ship. That's Tell us right. what it was like to be. I couldn't you believe. You must have been packed in there. It was, it was, that ship was huge. I couldn't believe that things were so big in them days, you know. But they were, yeah. But what was it like? If, uh, how often were you fed? And did you have to stand in long lines? We, uh, we had escort, the PBYs escorted us 300 miles out. And then from then on, we were on our own. That's the, that's the, the way we were supposed okay. to. Okay. Now, on board the ship, yeah. what did you do? We just, tell you the truth, most of the guys, did, uh, they played cards, they rolled dice, and just spent time on the ship just to, until we got to, we were going, we had to go a certain route, I guess. And we ended up in Glasgow, Scotland. Mm -hmm. You mentioned a PBY had cover for you three, 300 miles out. Yeah. Were you in a convoy? We, we, I don't know if we, we must have been in, were in there, a convoy. Were there other ships around you? Not that, I, not that I remember. Not that I can remember. Just you? No destroyer escort, nothing? No, no, not that I know of. We got destroyer escort when we went into the, um, the Straits in, in England there, when we were going into Glasgow in Scotland. Did you go to Glasgow or Greenock? We went to Glasgow, Osco, okay. uh, Scotland. Yeah, that's when, we, that's when they had the destroyers, two destroyers escort us. They picked you up and... That's right, yeah, that's right, yeah. And what, 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 did you just get off the ship and then what did you do? Then we got off into Glasgow. We came down to come into England and came down to um, the, what the hell was that port? Uh, Hampton was it? I don't know, but we, that's where we crossed the, the channel, the, the channel to go into France. We got on the ship there, and we went to the. That's when I, all I remember is we landed in La Havre, France. So this is after, obviously after D-Day. Then that's right. So it yeah. would be after yeah. June yeah. of '44. Yeah. Um, maybe a couple of months? A couple of months later, we, yeah, that's right, yeah. Do, do you know what month you landed in France? Uh, Was it the fall yet, you know, could it gonna be August, September? It was, I think it was in, when the hell was it? What was the weather like? Oh, it was, it was, uh, it was like today. But then uh, it, it was in the, the end of May or July or something like that. But then as we get into deeper into France, we get into um, high, the high elevations like in the mountains and we were going into, uh, we went over the Rhine River. When you got to France. That was in May, I think it was in May though. Well, it probably was after June, if you yeah, landed Yeah, after June, yeah. Um, when you landed, yeah. what were you told to do? What was your objective? We went, uh, let's see, we went to a big uh, railroad station in, the, in, in, uh, in La Havre, the big railroad station, and from then on we were going to go into combat. That's when we were going to go on and get on the tanks, right? Yeah. But it so happened that day the, uh, the train that was supposed to pick us up and take us in got hit and bombed, and we had to stay at the railway station until they had it fixed, and then we continued on. And that's when we, uh, we, got, on the, we got on the tanks. From then on, we were on tanks, 
And wherever we went, we were on, on the tank. We were in three companies. I was in A company. There was B company. And there was C company. You're in the 4th Armored... Armored Division. Yeah. The 4th Armored Division. Uh, were and you the, in the 3rd Army? But and the 10th Armored Infantry Battalion. Okay. But now, were, you, were, you, were you serving with Patton? Yes, with General Patton. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So and he was a good general. He yes, wasn't, evidently. Yeah, he was a good man because there wasn't anything he wouldn't do himself that he would tell us to do that he wouldn't do himself. He was a good general. So looking at the American battle line, you were on the right flank of it. You were on the, over on the right-hand side and moving toward, roughly toward Paris. Is that? We were going uh, towards, um, at that time, we were, going, we were going across the Rhine River. Mm -hmm. That's when they made the, to cross the river, the engineers had the pontoons and we crossed that river. And all alongside of us, there was smoke screen to protect us when, the, when we were on the tank going across the river. Were you under fire? Were you being shot at? We, we, every third day, A Company would take the lead. Then we'd go back and B Company would take the lead. Every time we had a, little, a spearhead, about every three days, all depends what, you, what resistance you met on the front. And then B Company would take in the back, and we'd be in the middle, and then C Company would take the lead. Understand what I mean? Yeah, you played leapfrog. That's yes, right. Yeah, we, every, so nobody would be at the, at the head all the time. And um, we traveled by day, so many miles, and we knew, our officers knew what destination they were to stop. And then we traveled so much at night. And then we'd have these, uh, we'd, we'd have, a, a, what you call it, a, a secret word that we'd know in case at night somebody'd come in and you'd have to see, they give you a secret word and you'd have to say the other half of it so you'd know who it was. So you would know it wasn't the enemy and they were always, to be in there, we always were against uh, the enemy, so that's, uh, but every third day or so. And then we had, on the back of the tank, we had one, one bad time that there's three different colors in the back of the tank. There was a, an oil cloth, and you'd have yellow, you'd have green, and I think the other one was blue. And every third day, you'd have to change that color and put it on the back of the tank so the, your, your Air Force could signify that you were an American tank. And if you had the wrong color, and if they were coming through, well, then you'd get bombed. It never failed. Did one, you ever have the wrong color? One day, we had the wrong color, and we were wondering what happened, because our B-47s, which gave us a good protection. B-47s? The, the B-47, they were fighter planes, yeah. They were heavy, heavy duty fighter planes. That's a P, P-47. Was it a P-47, is that what they were? Yeah. Well, well they had the, we had the P-51s late in the Thunderbolt. war. Thunderbolt. Yeah. yeah. But uh, one day we, were in, we, we, had to, we said we were in the perimeter of this town and we're holding off because there were snipers in the town and they were starting to pick off some of our men. So they happened to fly by and they saw the tanks in the area. And they circled around and dropped a few bombs. And of course the, the command post found out what was the problem was we hadn't changed the colors. So we quickly changed the colors. <laughs> and when they made the circle around, they saw the colors that were the right one and they took off. They didn't, that was one, one uh, problem that we had, and it killed a couple of our men, you know, at the time. Oh yeah, it, it, you have mistakes. But the, the snipers were dangerous too, you know. But we had one of our, we had a man in the outfit who was a, a sniper himself, because he carried a, a Springfield rifle. 
and he knew where the where the firing came from, and he took care of the took care of the uh, situation. Why did he carry a Springfield rifle? Why not the Garand or, or uh, some some other? Because he was a, he was gun. known as a sniper on our side. He would go after the the men that we couldn't see. We had M ones. We had M ones, and uh, but he was a, he had a, a Springfield rifle. Was a I don't know if it was a thirty odd six, whatever it was, but I knew it was a Springfield rifle. And he was uh, his job was to get the snipers in the in the, in the cities that we that we came to. That's all. That was his job, I what, think. What was the weather like at the time you're talking about? Has has winter set in yet, or? Is it, it, was cold? In, it was starting to rain when we got up in the uh, altitudes in the mountains of um, when we came to what is known as the Bremner Pass. We're in Germany now. And the Bremner Pass was towards uh, Switzerland. That's where uh, our outfit got contact with Mussolini, and that's where they they stoned him to death on that Bremner Pass. And uh, we were on top of there, and it was raining. And if the rain ever hit you in the hand, your hand had turned purple. It was so cold up there. Mm -hmm. it, was, it, was, it, was, it was, you know, it was starting during the winter, and, and the weather was cold, and the rain was cold. But we had, uh, we had uh, blankets, and the guy that took care of all that stuff was given to you, and you were protected. But um, you're, you're heading north. Yeah. Through the Brenner Pass, yeah. Toward what? Are you going up into Switz uh, not Switzerland, but not Austria? Not but in the, in, in the, the Alps, Europe. towards the Alps. Yeah, that's where it was. Yeah, okay. It's in the Alps, and uh, let's see. In and the you're, Alps. you're riding tanks all the time. All the time, we're on the tanks. Yeah. You, you yeah. told me before the we started this tape uh, that you had lost some of your hearing, and well, you think it's because you. You sat on these tanks all you the time. Sat on, well, you're on the tanks, and you, when you when, when you go into a city, you we had an interpreter, giving them, telling them, to surrender, or face the consequences. And if they didn't surrender, then we'd have to go in it and fight it out. Well, when you when they wouldn't wouldn't surrender. We didn't have any ear things on our on our ears. We just had no. Yeah, and my, to, even today my ears are always ringing, and I and I have to, I have to watch what you're saying because I can read your lips some somehow. Yeah. Because I went to school to read lipping in the VA for a year. Because uh, they made me do it, you know. I that some of my training, I guess. And but where where did the where did <clears throat> the noise come from? The from, firing of the from, cannons? From the firing of the guns. Okay. And when, you, when the tanks firing, you could, the explosion. And uh, then when you would have, um, like, the mortar shells. We used to have, the, the, from the Germans, when they come in, you never know where they landed. And those were, those were kind of loud. The mortar shells were, were tough. And, and there was a lot of things that I didn't understand that, <clears throat> But uh, if you ask a question, every time you ask a question, there was always something bad, so I stopped asking questions. Good idea. <laughs> I, <clears throat> one time, we were in Germany, and the ME-109 was the Messerschmitt. They, they came, and their mission was to get, it, get the, the Fourth Armored Division, the spearhead. And the main thing they don't go after was your uh, communications truck. If they sighted that, they'd, they'd blow that up, then you'd have no communication. You'd be lost, you know, from contact. Well, we went to a, a big field of, uh, of um, what were they, uh, not beets, turnips, that the Germans, when they had their, their farms, they made a big mound of, of turnips, and I happened to be going around this turnip to get away from the firing. And thinking that I was getting away from them, I was looking up, and every, everything was exploding up above me. I didn't know what it was. So I asked one of our commanders, I said, what is that exploding up above us? 
He says, that's what they call an anti-personnel bomb. He said it explodes up above and comes down. The strap comes down. I never knew that. So I didn't have to go around that beach, that mile on the beach, because no matter where I was, that strap could have come down and hit me. Well, they hit two of our men at the time. But that's some of the things that, uh, that's when I stopped asking questions. Because the more you knew, the worse off you were, I guess. I didn't, uh, but yeah, that's what, that's what happened. But they always went after the main thing. And we were a spearhead. We went and we stopped. When we got hold of the city, we always set a perimeter and held it. And if the foot infantry got up to us, we were safe. But if they didn't, we were always in trouble. Because the gasoline, the tanks had to be fed with gasoline. And when you ran out of gasoline, you couldn't go any further. That, that was the whole situation all the time. But... How did you get gasoline? To these get uh, two and a half tank trucks from the quartermasters. Is this the Red Ball Express that... Uh, yeah, that, that's yeah. what they were, yeah. And they had the... Uh, most of the, the quartermasters was uh, uh, the black uh, people, the black uh, soldiers. And we happened to be headed down. We were straight by these, by these warplanes one day. And we were in the, in, the, in, the, in the road, but we kept off of the roads as much as we could because they were landmines, see? And every time a landmine was hit, it hit a tank and throw it off. So we were strafed, and I was in the woods with the guys, and all at once I, I looked to my left and there was a, a black man next to me. I said, where'd you come from? He says, I was over there in that truck. I said, what's over there? He said, it's full of your gas. And he got away from it because if, that ever, if the planes ever hit that truck, Go on. He, he would have been gone too. Yeah. I was surprised. I, but that was the danger, you know, it was the danger. everything was dangerous anyway, no matter where you were. But uh, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. But that's what happens. Yeah, they supplied us with the gasoline and the ammunition, yeah. At any point, uh, if, if I got you in the in right place here, did your outfit stop getting gas so that other outfits to the left of you could be supplied? Didn't they cut off Patton's army and stop sending him gas? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Did this yeah, affect yeah. you? Yeah, but uh, let me see. When we were over there, they were stopped because when the Air Force used to come over, the B-17s, I could look up in that sky, and if they said there was 1,500 B-17s coming over, there was 1,500 B-17s because you could see them. Early in the morning, they'd come over, fly, and say about 3.30 in the afternoon, they did their mission in the cities, they, and you could see them coming back. I prayed to God they could all come back. Some of them sputtered. As long as they were on this side of the line, they were safe if they landed, you know. And uh, some of them were one engine, some of them were had two engines, some of them had the whole four engines, but you wouldn't believe all the planes you would see when they made a mission. That, that's how many they were. And they bombed the cities. Did you see uh, any pursuit of these planes by the Germans? Were the German fighters going after them or anti-aircraft batteries? Or did you see any of that? I saw two, two combat with the airplanes, with the Messerschmitt and our, and you said there were P-47s? And, and you said the P-51s as well. Yeah, they were, but these were the 47s. Yeah. And they, we happened to be in this city, and there was a hospital on top of the hill, a German hospital. And we were stopped at this city, and they had a, and we were looking up in the sky, and they had a, and you could tell they were fighting, because every time the machine guns on the plane would shoot, you'd see the vapor Little from the machine guns. Yeah. Out, yeah. yeah. And, and they hit one of the German planes, 
The German planes, I don't know where it landed, but the German pilot parachuted out and landed within our vicinity. Tell us about that now. You're watching a German pilot coming down in a parachute. Did you guys all run toward him? No, we don't, we don't, we don't take care of that because whatever company was on that side takes care of that. And they, they get the, the pilot that's involved in it, yeah. Because we, were, we happened to be in the city that was uh, protected, you know, with our soldiers. I don't know if it was C Company over there or B Company, but we could see from the sky because it was a clear day. It was a beautiful day, and I was amazed to see something like that. I really was. That our plane, wherever that plane landed, it was hit, and, it, and then you could see the parachute come out, yeah. and, the, and you could yeah. see him coming down. How many miles away it was, I couldn't tell you, but that was, that was quite a thing. In the larger <clears throat> view of what you were doing, what did your officers tell you? Where were you going? What was your objective? Were, were you going to, were you headed to Berlin or what? We, we weren't headed, to, we, weren't, we were in Bavaria, in the southern part of Germany. So were you in near Mu Munich anywhere? We were, um, we were in uh, what big city, like... Uh, Nuremberg? Uh, Nuremberg. We went on the Nuremberg Highway, and at that highway there, we were on one side, which was going towards where we were going. We were going to the Nuremberg, uh, you know that place where Hitler always made his speeches? With the big... Uh, the stadium. With the big... Uh, uh, the spot sticker was up at the top the, of the That's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. When we were in there... You were. We were in that, that, that stadium. Yeah. You wouldn't believe how huge it was. Our P-47s landed right in that stadium. Were you the guys, or were you there when they blew it up? They, you know, they blew Our it up. Our outfit blew it up. That's right, right. yeah. I was there, yeah. It blew it up. Tell that, us about that. What was the, well, whoever blew it up, I couldn't tell you. But they have special was, men to do. It's very effective. But we were there, and you wouldn't believe how big that stadium was. Oh, hundred thousand guys would. Huh? Hundred thousand troops could stand in it. Oh, gee, I couldn't believe it. Even our planes landed in it, and while we were going there, on the, we were on the Nuremberg Highway. I was on once. We our tank was on this side, and the other side was tanks coming this way. One of the tanks on that on the other side hit a landmine. Millions of tanks and, and, and carriers went over that spot, never, never exploded, and this, it, was a, it was a 37 millimeter tank. They were the lightweight tanks. They hit the, hit the landmine and hit it, and all that shrapnel from that tank come over on our side and hit us where we were. I have a piece of that shrapnel right stuck in my thumb right here. But my Red Cross, the guy that was in the Red Cross, he, uh, he lost our, all our papers, so I... No Purple Heart, huh? I, I didn't go after the Purple Heart. I never did. I could I went, go into VA. But I, I went into VA for my hearing most of the time because I, I couldn't hear half. I, I can't hear that good. And, uh, but I never went after the Purple Heart. No, I, I could do it because... Every time I have an x-ray, they come down and tell me about that piece of shrapnel I have stuck into the bone. And it's right there, I could feel it. I can feel it, you, you put your hand on it, you could feel it. Let's go back to the mine a minute. How come so many vehicles went up, up and down a road and then one of them gets... Hit it, hit it at the line. right spot and then it exploded. He, all I the other believe. guys had just been lucky or... Uh, I don't understand yeah, how I, a mine could lay there. I couldn't understand. Right on, right on the main highway too. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how it how it happened. But that's what happened. Yeah. I think it was a sergeant, sergeant Boston. He got hit. He got hit in the eye, and I got hit in the thumb, and uh, there was somebody else that got hit, but I couldn't remember. There's three or four of us that got hit by the the uh, whatever piece of the tank come across. But that's one of those freak accidents, you might say, you know? This is almost friendly fire, isn't it? Yeah. One yeah. of your own machines injures yeah. you. We were going in, in the Nuremberg at that time 
on that that big uh, highway that Hitler had made by all the prisoners. That the, Nuremberg, the Audubon. Yeah. The Audubon, that's what it was, yeah, the Audubon. Yeah, it was quite a thing, boy. But uh, on I that, gather you guys yeah. are still going north. Huh? You're, you're still going north now. Yeah, we're still going, yeah. We're going towards, uh, at that time, we were going towards uh, Czechoslovakia, in the Czechoslovakia. And uh, we went up towards Leipzig, was a big city, Leipzig. We, at, we, I never forgot that. We encountered uh, some German soldiers. They were in some kind of a, I forget if it was a church or a big building. And they heard us when we were coming with our tanks. And I could see them coming out, three of them coming out with their machine gun, carrying the ammo and going down to fire against us. But there was only, all I could see was three of them. And uh, it didn't take long to, to get them to lay down and surrender. Because uh, over there, the, I was, uh, during after the war, you learned a lot of these things. Uh, the regular army, which was the SS, was the main, uh, was the main trouble. They were the, the elite troops of Hitler, the SS. They were bad. They were really bad. And the regular army, when we used to go in a, in a place, we'd wait to get our orders to continue. We'd fire around into the woods where the soldiers were. And little by little, they'd surrender. They'd come out. And they, they let us, we, we fish them, you know, you go out and fish them and see if they had any guns on them or anything. And they'd always tell us they would have surrendered two days before if they knew that the SS officer had left them abandoned. You see, they never were told like we were told. We were, we have a lieutenant on our, on our uh, company. From a lieutenant, we have a sergeant. Then we have a corporal, and we have a PFC. That was you. That's right. And then we have a private. But we were all told ahead what we were come to, and if one of us got hit, the next in line would take over. Well, in their army, the SS was the boss, and they never told their, their soldiers what to expect. See, we knew what to do, but they never did. And that was the difference between how far ahead we were to fight. And they said, if we knew the SS had left us, we would have come out of the woods a long time ago because we didn't want to fight anymore. And that's how they gave up, little by little. You said you fired a round into the woods. What, was, what, <clears throat> what caliber was your uh, the, the, gun? The 37 millimeter tank would fire a round every three minutes into the woods. Your, is your tank the no, one you were? No, I was in the... Uh, I forget what was that, something the, bigger than that? Yeah, why, why was the, the Sherman tank? They were the largest tank at that time. There was a, I think it was a 96 millimeter. They had one big cannon in front of it, and I think it was 250 machine guns on the side. And then we had half tracks. We rode on half tracks, too. And they had a 50 caliber machine gun on the top. And uh, anybody could go on that and fire it because we were trained for it. And, and uh, we always got our information from uh, a, cub, a cub plane. You know the cub planes that they would reconnaissance. And they would fly into the, at, at late at night before sunset, they would fly and find out where the Germans would land, they could see, and they referred back to us in the tanks and give us the information that uh, they tell you well, you're up above, about five miles up above, there's uh, tanks waiting for you in certain sections of the woods, and you'd know about it, see? And they gave us all that information. And all, of course, we got a lot of information from, uh, what was that girl all the time singing our, our songs, make, trying to make us uh, feel, feel sad to go home and all this. Uh, Axis, Axis Sally, she was on the air a lot too, you know. And she sings mm -hmm. these songs, you know, to make you feel homesick. Lily Marlene. 
Huh? Lily Marley died. That was one of the songs that yeah. she yeah. <laughs> Lily Marley, yeah, right. But, but the Germans, when they ever heard of the Fourth Armored Division, and it was General Patton, they were worried. They worried about us because they thought we were bad people. We were very bad people. We kill everybody in sight, civilians, women, children. But every time you, you go into a city, our interpreter would tell them what to expect. If they didn't give up, then we'd have to go in and fight. And it was either, like our, my CEO always said to me, to our, our company, he said, you're not over home, he said, fighting cowboys and Indians. He says, you're over here, you're fighting your enemy. And if you don't take care of the enemy, he'll take care of you. That was the end of it. He said, now you gotta do what you have to do, and that's it. That's what we have to do. And, and every time we invaded a town, all the women and children were always down in the cellars. And if anything mistake did, say, say you went into a place that you were fired upon and you had to do, and you didn't know where the firing came from, you throw a hand grenade, and if it ever went down in them, one of them things, you'd kill the civilians, that was, the, that was the bad part. You didn't know. But, uh, and uh, a lot of our men got hit. And if you, you were lucky, every day was a battle to stay alive. That's what it was. Every day was a battle alone. Because when you're in enemy territory, you're in enemy territory. That's our, the way the size of it. We were told never to take a souvenir upon you. Like when we went into the towns, we'd go into the houses and talk to the people and, and get them out of there and send them away and we'd search for uh, snipers, right? And if you saw something good in the house that you would take on you, uh, never take it because if you, were, if you were, say you became a prisoner and they caught you with that, with that we ever took from their own people, they, you wouldn't survive because you, you, had, you, you did something to their own people and they, they would take care of it. Evidently, they would do, do away with you. That's all. That's what we were told never to touch anything, which I never did anyway. There were a lot of things you, you, would, you were tempted, but no. And a lot of things that they laid in them houses, the food, candy, and stuff, but you wouldn't know if they were poisoned. You know, you never knew if they were poisoned because we were told the different things. And uh, so we never touched anything. The only way you'd find out, the children used to come over when we, was, we used to be, the SS used to have billets, what they call billets. And they lived in those billets. And they, and when we searched the billets, because a lot of the officers in them towns used to change clothes in them houses and put on civilian clothes just to get out because near the end of the war they were losing. They wanted to get out and that's what they did. We'd find their uniforms in the closets. You know, they were all officers and they were all SS. But, and uh, one day we were in this town where we, we were off, we went on the outskirts and while we were in this, this town that we had taken over we were taking this town over in such a, 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 a fast time that we were decorated right there for that, for that effort that we did. What happened was, we were going into this town, and as I recall, there was supposed to have been all young troops into this town waiting for us. It was supposed to have been dug in. But it happened, it was alongside of a mountain where the railroad tracks came around the mountain and they were late getting there, and they were all on that train, and C Company happened to be over on the right side at that day, because we, they were over on the right, we were, B was in the middle, and we were over on the left. And as that train came around the corner, C Company saw them, the engineer saw what was going on, he saw the tanks all lined up. They shot at that train, 
with the 50 calibers, and all you could see was the steam coming out of it. And the engineers tried to stop it, but the weight of his troops on that train just came in, and we surrounded the whole, the whole bunch of soldiers and that, yeah, we took them as prisoners. That was something that probably wouldn't happen in a million years. This is such a, a visual thing that you've told us. I, I can see the train. Yeah, yeah, we could see it coming in, came around that mountain. You could see, and it loaded with the troops, young troops. But you took them prisoners rather than shooting up the train. We, we shot the train. You stopped the engine. They stopped the engine. Yeah. But you didn't shoot up the cars. What's that? You didn't shoot up the cars. Full no, of no, no. We kept That's because amazing. they gave, they surrendered because yeah. they were all we were right there waiting for them. You remember the name of the town? I don't know if it was Jena, Jena or. Uh, That's in Czechoslovakia then. Huh? You're in Czechoslovakia. We were in Czechoslovakia. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I think it was Jena. It was a it was a it was a big town, and um, after we were in that town, we were going through that town. You know, it's a funny thing. They were happy to see us, the Germans, the people, everybody, you know, because the war was coming near to the end because they were giving up all the time. And uh, we were, as we were told, we were bad people. The 4th Armored Division was bad people. Right. We would throw them, you know, we had rations. We had sea rations. And then those rations, we had those crackers, those white crackers, which they never, and we'd throw them out to the people, and they'd catch them. And they were tickle pink. And we were throwing them out one day. We happened to uh, hold on to this town until the foot infantry comes in. We had to wait for the foot infantry to take over. Otherwise, we'd have to, we'd have to stay yeah, there. They had to hold it, And yeah. I'm looking down, I was on top of the tank, and this woman down below says to me, how's everything in Chicago? She spoke plain English. I almost died, I says. I said, what do you mean? We're in Chicago, she, yeah. Yeah, she says, what do you mean in Chicago? She says, I'm from Chicago. Well, I, I said to myself, how could this be? She was over there before the war started on a vacation. And when she got stuck all during the war, she would had to stay there because she couldn't come home. Was she an American? She was an American, yeah. I thought I was saying, How's everybody, and who would you find out that would speak English say, how's everything in Chicago? I almost died when I heard that, you know. I couldn't believe it. But I never forgot that, never forgot it. Yeah, I think it was in the city of Jenna. I think that's where we got our combat infantry badge, too. So. Okay, now you're, you're this far up from where you started, and you <clears throat> say the war is almost over. Have you gone through Christmas? Well, yeah, we went through Christmas, yeah, yeah. Then we we've went. missed the Battle of the Bulge, so. We went through Christmas, yeah, right, yeah. Where were you when the the, the affair at Bastogne, the Ardennes campaign? Gee, I, I really couldn't say. I really don't know. I really couldn't say. I don't know if we were in, um, we were in the cities before that, where one of the big cities like Erfurt and Jena and, and Gothia. We were in that in some areas like that there. I don't know. The Battle of the Bulge, I couldn't tell you. I really don't remember. So you've been through the whole winter now, and is it getting to be the, the spring of 45 now? During the winter, we were in there. Let me see. We never saw any, you know, they talk about entertainment, but we never saw any entertainment during the winter or any time. We never even saw the kitchen cooking for us because we had rations, that's all we ever had is rations. Spearhead your way ahead of all your troops. And that was, and you, were, you were shut off from, from, your, from your whole line in the back because you're always ahead and you'd hold a, you'd hold a town until they got there. That's all I could tell you about that. But, uh, but in, uh, we went to a, a city of Regensburg. That was a big city, Regensburg. That's where they made all their Messerschmitts in the mountains, underneath the mountains. We went around that mountain. Is this Regensburg or Regensburg? Regensburg. It's Regensburg not is a the big ball city. bearing. Huh? It's 
not the ball bearing city. Well, in Bavaria, Regensburg, I think was the name of okay. Regensburg. It was a big city. They made all their airplanes, motor airplanes, in underneath the mountain, inside the mountain. We, the reason why we knew that, we went around that mountain. We didn't even know they were in that mountain doing what they did until we got on the other side of it where the, where the entrance was. And boy, did we have a hard time. Regensburg was a big city. It was a large city in Bavaria. That was down, down toward the Danube, the Danube River. The Danube River ran from the Russian side into the German side. And uh, then we went from Regensburg, we went down to, we went down south in the Bavaria, we, 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 in Chemnitz. That was another big city, Chemnitz. And I never forgot that because if we went any further, we were in uh, Austria, which we shouldn't have been in Austria. They found out we were in the wrong country and we had to travel back. Mm. And when we were in there, we met three girls that was in the Red Cross serving coffee and donuts in that area. And there was, it was, they were in the battle zone. One of the girls came from Needham. I never forgot what her name was, I couldn't tell you. But that's the only time I ever, and there was the Red Cross. I couldn't believe it. I never forgot that because she came from Needham and they were, they were taken out of there right away because they were in enemy territory. They got, must have got lost or something when they, but we weren't supposed to be down, we were in Chem, I think it was in Chemnitz, in Chemnitz, Germany. Yeah, and uh, from then on, then on May, it was, this was in May, when we were down in that area, it was okay. in May. Good. The weather was warm, and, um, and then from there, we went back to, uh, in Regensburg, we just was in Czechoslovakia though, I think, was it? we were in Czechoslovakia, we went back in the, uh, what the heck was the, the name of that city? It was Leipzig was one of them. The if town. It's, if it's May, huh? If it's May, yeah. The war is over in Europe, right? The, the war was coming. It was, yeah. it was over. Yeah, it was coming over. And I forgot we were in we were in the little town of I call it Pole, P O L E. But uh, on the map it said something else. But it was May before the surrender of the war, and we were in a big field, big field, and we were gonna make a, 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 a what you call it, a, to, in, to, to a force that we were gonna go into and pick up uh, a body of, of 250,000 SS between us and the Russians, that they were kept, kept going back, back, and they were, they were all one big group, and that was, the, that was near the end of everything. And um, we were gonna make a, a, a push, that's what it was, a push towards them. And the cup plane came flying down in front of us, and we were gonna, A Company was on the lead to begin with that time, we were, and then B and C Company. And we were gonna make the, we had just started the motors, all ready to go, and the cup plane from way back radioed into the tank, in the, at the tank, and said, stop all advancement. And we had to stop to see what he had to say. Well, he flew down, landed in that field, and, and said that they were signing the treaty in Kiel. Kiel was a Kiel, Germany, a submarine base in Kiel, K-E-I-L, Germany. The, he was a submarine commander in charge of the whole Germany at that time. And they were signing the peace treaty, so we stopped there. And on May, was it May 8th that the war ended? And we were right there. We sat there, waited, and May 8th the war ended. And all we did was look at each other. We didn't, no celebration. No, so no one to celebrate. Back up a couple of weeks now. Yeah. Back up to uh, sometime in April, 
Yeah. April of 45, yeah, you guys April, are still yeah. in combat. Yeah. But you know that the, the war is almost over. Yeah. Did you be, did you do things to make very sure you ain't gonna get killed in the last few weeks? Did you behave differently or attack differently or just sit in your tank and no, hope for the we, best? We, we still had to go because the war wasn't over. Yeah. And we still had the enemy in front of us in those towns, like I told so you. So nothing changed? Nothing changed, no. And you no. just hope you ain't going to get that's hit in it. the last we, minute. That's it. That every day, every day was a battle yeah. to stay alive. That, that's the whole thing. And if you were lucky, you stayed till the next day. In your unit's history, when, when you read about what your outfit did, uh, yeah. do they tell you how many days you folks were on the line? All the way from La Harve, yeah. all the way up into Czechoslovakia. All the way into Czechoslovakia. How many days was that? Months? Well, I think it was a, about a year, a year in, uh, <clears throat> a year, about a year and almost a year and a half. I mean, I was in. It, and every single day? Every single day fighting. we moved. We always yeah. moved, yeah. Always moved. We were lucky. I was lucky. Some of the men that was with me weren't lucky. They got hit, some of them, some of them just died, they got hit, you know, got killed. And yeah, every day was a lucky day. And when every time you went into combat, you, they were the, the one that went into combat, and they were the one that always went, we found out later, when we got our combat infantry badge, our CO, he came from Westfield, I think, Westfield, Mass. He was my, he was my, uh, the man that I always liked. He was my CO, commanding officer. And he knew me like a book. And I could talk to him. He could talk to our troops. He was then, he was, I think he was a captain, but he came up the lines from the sergeant all the way up to a captain. And from a captain, when the war ended, he was a colonel. He became a colonel, and um, I don't know if you knew Archie Morris. He was on the fire department with me. We were both in the fire department, and Archie Morris was in the Red Cross. And he always says to me, "Why don't you go and see your commanding officer that you fought with in during World War II? He's up Speed Street. He was made civil defense." Command. He was the head of the civil defense in in in, uh, in uh, peacetime. By the governor was it Governor Volpe or Governor John Volpe? Was it Volpe that made him uh, civil defense? And he was up there, up at P Spring Street. And one day I took off. I says I'll have to go and see him because I actually kept telling me. He says he was your CEO. He'd be glad to see you. He was in the National Guard then. But then he was made civil defense commander. And uh, so I went up there to see him one day, and he was behind the desk. And I went in, and I see all these officers waiting to see him. And the girl comes out and says to me, who do you wish to see? Well, I wish to see, uh, I knew him as Colonel Donnelly. I like to see Colonel Donnelly. He says, well, whoever's in there, when he gets through, he says, I'll call you and you can go in. I say to myself, gee, with all these officers waiting to see him, but I was a civilian. He said, I had preference over, so I went in, and he's at the desk, and he says to me, what can I do for you? I looked at him, I says, you know, this is a long time after the war, you know, and he says to me, are you in the National Guard? Is something to do with the National Guard? I says, no. I says, no, I says, uh, I was in your outfit during the war. What's your name? He, I told one, he said, hey, he, he started swearing in front of me. He says, oh, he says, then, you know, he says, oh, he says, my God, he goes, he says, am I glad to see you? He says, you know, things, when we were there, you never stopped, you kept going, going, going. He says, now you're in peacetime. You have so much time to yourself. He says, I don't know where I am half the time. 
He said, but boy, am I glad to see you. And he said to me, anytime you get time, you're in my area. And I think he came from Westfield, Mass, outside of Worcester. And he said, come and see me. I'd love to see you. Come at my house. He, I guess in his, in his, uh, in his civilian life, he was a lawyer. He was an attorney. But boy, I could trust him. I, I trusted my life on that man. He was a good, he was a good leader. He was a good leader. And uh, he became a brigadier general in the, in, the, in the National Guard. That's what he was when I knew him the last time. He was a brigadier general. Gal, uh, you've, you've told us a good story here of a lot of fighting and combat and places yeah, you yeah. saw. Was there a most, most memorable experience out of all of that? Is there <clears throat> one thing that you could tell us that you remember more than anything else? Well, I do remember when we were coming back, we were supposed to come back. They had a ship strike at that time. And Truman was our president because Roosevelt got killed when I was in combat. We knew that. I mean, he died. President Roosevelt died. And then Truman took over. And they had a ship strike. And he was doing all kinds of things to get it. Because we had to stay in France during the winter month. I think it was in February and March. We were in France trying to get home. And it was the winter. And it was cold. And a lot of our boys got sick because we slept in pup tents with the cement, the old World War I pup tents with the cement floor on the bottom. And our soldiers, our GIs, didn't know we had, uh, what, what did you call those, those beds where you, you, you put out? Cots. They were, just, cots. They were cots. Beds. Is this in 46? In 46 when we were coming home. There. Yeah. Didn't you have enough points to get home? I, I had 25 points to get home. We, we, when we came back to Germany, we were in the city of, uh, in the town of Kelheim, off in the city of Regensburg in Kelheim. We were, uh, what did you call, um, what the, was that word? Like, like patrolmen, we were. Um, MPs? Huh? MPs? Like MPs, but yeah. they, they had a name for it. We were, uh, gee, I can't think of that name. But anyway, we stayed there until we were ready to come home. The, we and there were, was uh, a ship strike. Huh? There was a ship strike, you say. There was a ship strike, and we couldn't get home. So we had to stay in Regensburg all that time, waiting for our orders to come home. And then when we did come, try to come home, uh, we started to come home. I had 25 points to, enough to get home. Our relief were coming in. We were police. We were on police duty over there. That's what it was. You're like an MP, and uh, we were coming home. And when we were coming home, you could see the GIs coming in on this side of the fence. There's a big fence in France, with the incoming and outgoing. And we stayed. I think I forget if it was La Havre again coming home. I forget. But well, anyway. I looked on the other side of my of the fence, and I spotted one of the boys from New Mexico that was in the guy from the band. Back in the band, <laughs> he was coming in the other side. I couldn't believe this. I never forgot his name. His name was Joe Delgadillo. He was a, an American Indian, Mexican Indian, and I yelled at him. He looked at me, but the line. Pushes you. You tell him you're in the wrong line. Uh, he, he was just coming in. I was going home, yeah. and we had a ship strike there, and we come home. The best thing in my life was to see those. We came home on a big, the biggest ship coming home when they did arrive, and in New York Harbor, I never forgot this. It was May 21st. I mean March 21st. We were in New York Harbor coming home. And all those fireboats with those water spouts all around us, shooting the water, tooting their horns. 
and you could see the Statue of Liberty, and it was a beautiful day in the 70 degrees. Everybody was in their T-shirts. I never forgot that. First day of spring. It was the first day of spring. I never forgot. And we come home in New York, and that's where that's where we landed in New York City. And oh, what a day! What? Where? And I got discharged. Yeah. The same place I went in in Camp Devens. With uh, you, you got in and out through Devens. Well, tell us what rank and what decorations you had at the time you were discharged. Uh, well, I had the I had the ribbons. You know, the ribbons I had was the African ribbon and the European ribbon. Good, good conduct. That's the first thing you get anyway. The good conduct ribbon and the. Um, um, Combat infantry badge and the two battle stars. That's about all I can remember that I had. Yeah, but getting home was was a good thing. Did you and, sit down and talk with your family about where you'd been and what you'd done and what you'd seen? Did you talk with anybody about it? No, I very I, I didn't ever talk to any. No, no, I. Because we liberated two prison camps. One was Buchenwald, and one was Dachau. I left that out because uh, they were they were real bad. To see what happened to the the prisoners, I could tell you some of the sights I saw there that you wouldn't believe. All the dead people there, they were. I could tell you some of them. When we first went in, there was a whole circle of dead that they had taken all the gold out of their teeth. And in that circle was one American aviator. And my CO said, get that man out of there right away. I don't want him in there, because he was an American. I didn't blame him. And on the other side, there were hangers of people covered, that were dead, covered with lime, so the flies wouldn't. They, they, were, they were already gone. There were stacks of them. And you go down a little way. We had to go through the hole. We went through it because we liberated it. We, we had to see what we liberated. And it was bad because in that, in that, in that camp, Buchenwald, there was a, where they all stayed in little places, holes with hay that they slept in. And they were starving to death. Down below, there was a big hole with all the urine and all the people that they threw in there. And further down, there was a railroad, railroad ties, tracks, covered with ashes that they burned to death. And on the right, there was the gas chambers. And next to the gas chamber, there were ropes where they hung them and, and shot them. And all the, all the bad things that could happen. It was, and, and in that camp, there was that Mrs. Miller. She was making lampshades out of our, out of human hide. And I never forgot, over here, she was tried over here. She got 20 years for doing that. 20 years, and then she was free for all the things that she did. That, uh, that's a bad, that was a bad sight. That was a bad sight. And the minute you liberated some of those, those camps, the people got out, they wouldn't listen to our interpreter, what they had to say. They told them, don't go in the woods, stay on, on the open where they could see you. Because if they went in the woods, there were still German soldiers in there, they would get shot. And a lot of them, oh, it was bad, real bad. That was the worst thing in, in the war was to see those camps. And people did suffer. They did. Gal, is, um, we're getting to the end of the tape now. Is there anything I haven't asked you here today one more thing that you'd like to put on this tape uh, to tell your family or other people that will watch this uh, a long time from now. One other last thought. I never, I, I really didn't say too much to the boys that I have, you know, but uh, I never even told my wife what I went through because she, she lost one of her brothers in, in Omaha Beachhead. And, uh, and it was it was kind of a 
I never told my mother anything because she was happy to see me. Yes. You know, things, yeah. I never, never said anything. I, my brother that was in the band with me in civilian life, he was in the, he was in the service too. He was in, he was in the, he never went overseas, but I, I was the one that went overseas because I was the oldest in there. Yeah. Out of a hundred, I think there was 152 of us that left that day, but I don't know how many of them come back or what happened to them, you know. I never even knew who in the band, wherever they went, because they all went somewhere, mm -hmm. but uh, no. But most of the men around in the outfit were all from different states anyway, you know, but they were nice, they were nice. We all stuck together good. We did the best we could. And, but, like I say, if you were in there for one day, it was still a battle. If you were in there for one year, still, still the same. It's from day to day living, that's all it was. That's all I can tell you. Gal, thank yeah. you very much. Okay. We appreciate that's you coming nice. in today. I'm glad I could say some of these things.